start recording right away. All right, here we are with another episode of Coffee with the Founder. I got my coffee cup here. Got my coffee. And of course, we got another outstanding guest, uh, a, a, a friend, a colleague, <laughs> uh, a brother. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, Christian Picciolini. Uh, Christian, listen, we've been doing these coffee talks as a way to introduce people in the WPC network and the WPC family to all the good folks that are doing the work they're doing, not only when they're on the stage or in workshops, but when they get back to their homes, how their work came about, and just getting to know folks who are out there doing the kind of work that we're doing. So we're glad you could join us. But let's start by just asking you to introduce yourself. How do you tell people who you are and what you do? Well, Dr. Moore, thanks for having me, first of all. Uh, I uh, currently uh, run an organization called the Free Radicals Project that helps people disengage from extremist movements, um, mostly white supremacist groups. Been doing that for about 20 years. And most people ask, well, how did, how did you get into that kind of work? And that's because 30 years ago, when I was 14 years old, I was recruited into a white supremacist neo-Nazi skinhead group, where I spent uh, eight years from the time I was 14 until I was roughly 23 years old. Uh, as a member of that group, uh, somebody who was violent, as somebody who was a propagandist, who recruited other people, uh, and eventually found my way out and worked to try and repair the damage that I caused during those years. And I've been doing that uh, for about 24 years now. Uh, in this environment, I don't, unfortunately don't think that uh, it's, uh, you know, work that's going to come to an end anytime soon. Uh, but uh, yeah, in a nutshell, that's what I do is I try and use the experience of my past and the insight that I gained during that time, not only to try and repair the damage that I've caused, but also to try and prevent it from happening in the future. Yeah. Now, uh, can you tell us a little bit over the 20 something years, what did white supremacy, white supremacy look like then versus yeah. what it looks like to now? Is it the same? Are there some, uh, give us a sense of evolution changes when you think about or talk about white supremacy or white supremacist groups right how does that look different today as opposed to what it looked like when you recruited were were recruited at 14 years old yeah well i mean i think in terms of like the white supremacist power structure not much has changed unfortunately that's been the same for hundreds of years uh, but in terms of like the more visible hate movements and things like that 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 have come out of that um in the 80s, we were very visible. We were, you know, we had shaved heads and had tattoos and, and waved flags and wore patches that, you know, we wanted to show people what we were about because we were a fringe group at that time. We, you know, the militant wing of this thing was very small in, in the 80s, uh, but it also started to get infiltrated by law enforcement. We recognized that that was a liability to be seen because we wanted to terrorize people. and We did by the way we looked, but then we saw it as a liability because we were being infiltrated. It was becoming too easy to target us. So we decided to blend in. We started to tell people, grow your hair out. Don't get tattoos. Don't even join a group like the Klan or become a skinhead because it's too easy to take those groups down. Go out on your own. Be a lone wolf. Uh, still influence people and still, you know, pledge allegiance to the to the cause, but don't show it. And that's when people started to really blend in. And one of the first people to do that uh, was David Duke when he got rid of the Klan robe uh, and you know gave up his position as the Grand uh, Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan and and became a politician. He you know, won a, a seat in the House of Representatives uh, for Louisiana. So that was really kind of the start of that normalization of the more militant side of the white supremacist movement. Uh, and today, you know, we're talking about the alt-right, which is, you know, dressed in khakis and polo shirts and look like, uh, you know, some of our young Republicans on college campuses. So it's very difficult now uh, in this movement that has grown exponentially to even decipher who's who. Yeah, that's helpful. I want, I want to ask you a little bit about just kind of how you almost like cipher them out. Are there some ways or uh, have you or, or come up with or thought about some ways to really, uh, let's say if I was interviewing people for a job to kind of get a sense of maybe them leaning in that way. So uh, I want to ask you about that. But uh, first, I want to um, come back to um, kind of David Duke and, and, and what it looks like. So that's a political figure. Is it possible like in school buildings, teachers or administrators or bankers 
I mean, are we talking about an all out infiltration of the general population? Yeah, I mean, I think as far as like a strategic infiltration, that wasn't what happened. But I think strategically, the ideology infiltrated the mainstream to a certain degree. And those people who now believe the same things that I did 30 years ago, things about, uh, you know, the Holocaust not happening, or that blacks were responsible for all the crime, or, you know, that AIDS was, you know, man, all these, you know, things that are still coming up today, but they're not being spouted by Klansmen or skinheads or, or you know, American Nazi party members are being spouted by teachers. And in some cases, you know, people in, in positions of authority, and in some cases, you know, politicians. So I think the ideology has definitely seeped into the mainstream. Whereas before, you know, white supremacy was control of power over other people. Now the, the ideology of white supremacy and some of the more kind of white nationalist ideologies have crept into uh, people in the mainstream who happen to have positions of power. You know, they may be our dentists, they could be our teachers, they could be our airline pilots. Uh, you know, for us to think, you know, if we want to talk about privilege, for us to think that a white person who has access to a plane like a pilot or a flight attendant couldn't fly that plane into some buildings like some brown skin people did that is the definition of of how we are privileged looking at this this terrorism situation yeah. because we see acts of terrorism by you know white extremists uh, all the time i mean weekly it seems like uh, you know, uh, and uh, and we don't talk about it or give it the same weight as we would, you know, when 19 people fly, you know, two buildings into into the Twin Towers. So, uh, just so I'm clear, how do you define white supremacy, white nationalist, alt right? Are all those things synonymous? It's like if we were talking about the NFL. And you had, you know, 26 or 28 teams that all had different logos and different philosophies on how to execute their offense or their defense or strategy on how to recruit players or, you know, who their coach was. It's kind of the same thing. If we look at, you know, white supremacy as this umbrella term, it's an ecosystem of all different kinds of Klansmen, of skinheads, like the old traditional, you know, kinds that we're used to hearing about. But in that, there are also the more ac pseudo academic kinds like the alt right and, you know, some of the more Holocaust skeptic or Holocaust denier types. Uh, you know, you, within that you have, you know, anti vaccine and, and conspiracy theorists, you have, you know, all different wings within this ecosystem that kind of have a different purpose. Uh, some are meant to recruit, some are propagandists, some are meant to terrorize, uh, you know, some are meant to keep order, some are meant to protest. Uh, and it really depends on, you know, who's kind of shaping that little part of, of that ecosystem. But they really do all overlap. You know, some of the militia groups, uh, you know, while I don't, I, you know, people think, well, militias, you know, aren't inherently white supremacists. There's a lot of overlap with that. There are a lot of white supremacists who are in these militia groups and then start to change the philosophies of these groups to, to kind of, you know, move more over ideologically to the white supremacist side. Uh, it's very, it's hard. And that's by intent. They don't want us to pinpoint them. They want us to keep chasing this, this ghost that they keep painting. Uh, so we can't ever really pin it down. Otherwise, they lose the control, the power that they've built out. So can you talk a little bit about the recruitment? If you can remember being 14 and what was enticing for you at that time, I'm not sure, you know, all the things going on, but I'm wondering, like, are they still using those same tactics today? So if I'm a parent of a, a young white male, 14 year old, what should I be looking at? What should I be concerned about? Well, nobody's, nobody's born a, a white supremacist ideologically. It's something that we learn, uh, but it's not something that people typically chase. Instead, what they're searching for uh, in their life's journey is a sense of identity, community, and purpose. Uh, and those groups do a really, really good job of providing a sense of very clear identity, a community like a family, uh, and, and certainly you know, a, a purpose, even though it's, it's a toxic one. But along our life's journey, we also hit what I call potholes in the road that detour us to the fringes, right? And potholes are anything like trauma, abuse, mental illness, poverty, 
even privilege is a pothole if it keeps us too separate from from society and from reality that can detour us to the fringes where these narratives extremist narratives narratives of drug abuse suicide i mean like all of these really toxic kind of narratives um exist and they're looking for vulnerable people at 14 years old when i was recruited i was standing in an alley i was smoking a joint and this guy with a shaved head came up to me and he pulled the joint from my mouth and he said that's what the communists and the jews want you to do to keep you docile young man i didn't know what a communist was i didn't know if i'd met a jewish person and i didn't even know what the word docile meant at 14 years old but it was the first person in my life because i'd been bullied i felt like an outsider I felt like I didn't belong and was alienated. He was the first person that, that drew me in. He was the first person to promise me a sense of identity of who I was, uh, of community, of who my family was and where I belonged and, and what I was supposed to do with my life, my purpose. And I bet I didn't know anything about racism. I wasn't raised a racist. My parents are Italian immigrants who came to the U.S. in the 60s. And they were the victims of prejudice oftentimes when they came over. So it wasn't something that I was raised with. They had friends from Iran and, and you know, Spain and, and Mexico and all these places. So I always was exposed to it. But what I was searching for was my parents' attention because as immigrants, they had to work 16 hours a day, seven days a week, and I never saw them. I knew they loved me, but I also needed to do things to, to, to get their attention. I didn't know that that's what I was doing at the time. I thought, you know, well, I'm just going to kind of make my own way. And I, w the reward I was getting from white supremacy was greater than the anonymity that I didn't have or that I had without it, right? So I was willing to trade away all the things that didn't make sense, that seemed awful, that I even knew were wrong because I was getting a reward of this identity, this community and purpose, which frankly is something we all look for and that, that kind of shapes our, every single one of our values. So as a young man, I, you know, they, they drew me in. I was lured in. You know, what I think is powerful is when someone has the kind of history and then they acknowledge and move forward, right? As a way to not only, you know, somewhat heal, but also maybe work with others who may be in that position. I was reading a story about a potential white nationalist, white supremacist that had essentially hidden into society until he had been revealed through some story. Um, mm -hmm. And it made me think, to what extent was there participation amongst, uh, within these groups from people who are currently in power positions today? Do you get a sense or uh, mm -hmm. do, 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 do you sometimes have a sixth sense? Like I could see a person walking, I think, oh, that cat played some football back in the day, right? Like. Are, are there some things that you notice that stand out for you just because you've been, you know, you know, kind of part of both the ugly, but also now working on the positive side of that? I think to the annoyance of my wife, uh, I, I have that spidey sense about mm -hmm. it, unfortunately. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I hear things, I hear, you know, certainly dog whistles or policies or things that, you know, sound like they're bad, but I know that they're rooted in ideas that, um, you know, I used to believe 30 years ago. Um, I never thought I'd see the day 30 years ago when, you know, the president of the United States would be, you know, either retweeting or saying some of the same words or standing up for some of the people that I used to be, you know, like the people that I used to be 30 years ago. Uh, and yet here we are, um, you know, things like white genocide conspiracy theories being retweeted, you know, the idea that uh, whites are being outbred and will uh, eventually die off or that crimes, you know, from blacks against whites are so great that eventually they'll, you know, I mean, all of these ridiculous ideas that um, now are making bubbling up to the mainstream. So, you know, yes, did, do I remember people in power back then? Yeah, I remember, you know, businessmen with money who would donate, who you'd see at Klan rallies. I remember, uh, you know, hearing uh, stories about other groups that we were close with, you know, corresponding uh, that back in those days, it was like through PO boxes and regular mail, like, you know, with, uh, you know, lower level politicians and things like that. There were, uh, you know, certainly, you know, people with influence that, that, um, you know, would uh, show their support in certain ways. Um, yeah, you know, I, do I think there's this mass conspiracy of white supremacists hiding in the United States? Uh, no, but do I think that there are a lot of white supremacists hiding in the United States? Yes. 
Mm. Uh, I think that there are a lot of people who are not being really honest with, you know, in public with what they really believe uh, and will fight in secret for, to uphold those values, even though, you know, they may not say it to, to our faces. Um, I think that there are a lot of people in positions of power who, you know, either because of the circumstances have become jaded uh, and are easier to recruit. Uh, you know, people working in, in the prison system or police officers, things like that, they're easier to recruit because they see they're kind of like put into the really bad situations and the trauma of dealing with that makes them easy to convince that the whole world is like that. Mm. So, you know, military people coming back, white supremacists have always done a very good job of trying to recruit those people, not only because they have the skills that they need, you know, weapons training, hand-to-hand -hand combat and all that stuff, but also because they know they're traumatized people who are easy to seduce with these narratives, uh, yeah. you know, that it's not, their pain is not their fault. Yeah. It's somebody else's fault. I, I often wonder if the ones with the weapons trainings are more dangerous than the ones with the financial training or political training. Uh, but it makes me ask about job interviews, about uh, mm -hmm. college recruitment. Um, in your opinion, should we be screening for white supremacists in reference to entering into these organizations? And if so, have you thought about what are some questions? I mean, I know you talk about the spidey sense, so to speak, but are there some questions that I wonder we should be developing for colleges, for banks, for universities, for schools to kind of cipher out, so to speak? You know, that's a, that's a really tricky question because, you know, access to information changes people, right? So like me going to school and me getting a job and me being exposed to the people I thought I hated actually was what de-radicalized me because all of a sudden I wasn't demonizing them and I was humanizing them. And, and I was, you know, from the time I was 14 until I was 23, never put myself in situations to challenge what I believed. And then all of a sudden when my worldview changed, my you know, when my world changed, my worldview started to change. So I don't think we should be keeping them out because I think that's exactly kind of what makes, you know, that, that isolation from reality, that, you know, narcissism, that, you know, the world re revolves around me is kind of what creates this to some degree. However, you know, should they be in positions where they can affect the safety of other people like doctors or law enforcement or politicians even, I think that, you know, there's an argument to be made that, you know, somebody who doesn't value human life, you know, of a, a person of color in private probably shouldn't be in a position to where they have to make a decision to value their life in, you know, public, uh, you know, to make a decision to save their life or, or to shoot or to not shoot or whatever. So I think there, there, this is a complicated question and needs a lot of discussion, but I think that there's a valid, valid argument that if somebody's personal views don't value somebody's life, how can they do that in their job? Yeah, yeah. So what are you saying to parents, right? Like if you had a PSA to parents of white kids, yeah. particularly white males, you know, what would be your message to them as a way to kind of be um, somewhat attentive to or preventive of some of the things that kind of drew you in. It's going to sound a whole lot like, you know, 1990s uh, suicide prevention campaign and some ways, you know, anti-drug or anti-bullying campaigns. If your kids are isolated, if they're withdrawn, if they're struggling with social anxiety, if they're bullied, if they're, um, you know, suddenly changing their habits and, and not doing the things that they love to do anymore, they're searching for identity, community, and purpose, and they're susceptible to, to, radical, to radicalization to an extremist behavior. And when I say that, you know, extremism doesn't just have to be political, right? It can be personal extremism. Suicide is an extremist act. It is the act of me murdering somebody, myself, because, you know, I'm angry, I have a grievance, I have a struggle, I have a pain that I can't overcome, whatever. And that's the same, in many cases, the same reason why somebody walks into a place of worship and murders people. Maybe that it's not themselves that they're trying to, you know, 
eliminate the pain from, but it's, you know, in some other way. Drug abuse is a personal extremism. Uh, you know, uh, joining a cult is, a, is extreme. All of these things manifest because we're searching desperately for identity, community, and purpose. And if we don't find positive outlets for that, then the only other options are oftentimes these very, very negative ones that are looking for these people to draw in. They're not looking for the best of the best, the most, you know, motivated, the smartest in many cases. They're looking for the people that they can easily lure in with this promise of paradise uh, and if you're full of joy and your life is you know satisfying and you know things are relatively good you're typically not looking for those outlets uh, like that so i think for parents you know we need to look for the ones that are the most vulnerable i think to this and that is uh, sometimes even the ones who have a lot of you know, drive and have a lot of things going for them, but don't have the outlets to fulfill those things also are easily drawn into these things because they look, I was an idealistic kid. I, I was, you know, at 12 years old, drawing plans for hotels that I wanted to design and this and that. I wanted to do good things. I just had no outlets for it. And then somebody gave me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can you talk about the internet, uh, the social media because I'm imagining 14 for you, it wasn't as prevalent as it is for a 14 year old today. Uh, there was no internet. <laughs> yeah, can you talk a little bit about the challenges, the new challenges that social media, the internet brings about in reference to white supremacy, white supremacist groups? Yeah, well, it, there was no internet when I was a 14 year old, you know, in 87, uh, it didn't really start being popular in, until the nineties. Um, and I had to find it in an alley standing there and then somebody had to hand me a pamphlet, put their hand on my shoulder, invite me to a meeting, a rally, something like that. Uh, the internet today is providing a platform where you don't need that anymore. It's a 24 hour, all you can eat hate buffet if that's what you're looking for. Right. Um, and, you know, if we think about the millions of 14 year old me's that are out there today, lonely, isolated, maybe struggling with things, maybe, you know, maybe their home situation's not great. Maybe, you know, whatever it is that they're searching for, they can find it online and recruiters know that. So they're going to all the places where young people searching for identity, community and purpose are. They're going to multiplayer online video games. They're talking to our kids over their headsets. They're going online to forums, they're going to depression forums and autism forums where, you know, people are opening up about like personal issues and they're kind of trolling for people there. Um, you know, they're going to the digital alleyways uh, of my youth. They're going to the places where young people hang out where they know that if they throw enough out there, they're going to, you know, reel in enough people. Um, so, you know, I worry about that. The internet's a great place. It's a great place to learn and connect with people. It's also a place where sometimes, you know, we voice the things that maybe we really feel that we don't say in public that we've never really had the chance to work out. So there's so much polarization and arguing and things like that, but we have to understand that it's creating the perfect storm for young people because uncertainty is what drives extremism drives radicalization. When the environment is uncertain, people are looking for answers. And sometimes the loudest voices who happen to be the fewest voices are the ones getting through. And those are the extremists. Uh, so uh, we have to be careful. I think this is a very dangerous time uh, right now where we're all searching for answers and we're not really vetting the, you know, the material that we're getting those answers. Yeah. And um, I wanted to ask you about, you know, just what you say to young people in light of all of those challenges, particularly when we think about video games, social media, internet in general. But before that, um, uh, I, I was going to ask you about what Malcolm Gladwell writes about his 10,000 hours, right? He mm -hmm. says that this is what really allows you to reach your highest level of excellence. And it made me think about, you know, reversing those things that you may have become an expert on. Was there a time you felt like, I think I got this shit out of my system? Or, 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 or as a recovering drug and alcoholic, I feel like I'm never done like one day at a time, but I feel a lot stronger after 20 something years yeah. of sobriety than I did after two days. So give me a sense or give us a sense of kind of how you feel about, you know, finally having 20 plus years of this kind of thinking behind you, but also the things that you put in that have been great, that have been good, that have been positive, yeah. that can 
help keep that at distance? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I don't think it's like maybe how it might be for somebody who's experienced alcoholism or drug addiction in the sense that, like, I don't crave that drink, right? Like some people might still like 20 years after not drinking, be like, I still think about having that drink every day. I don't think about wanting to be racist or don't think racist thoughts. In fact, it's the opposite. Like I, you know, like, it, I just literally cannot stop thinking about ways where I see racism all the time. So maybe in that way, it's kind of like a, it's developed a, a traumatic, like a PTSD to me, to where I'm hypersensitive now to when I do see it. Um, but in, in the way that it is like an addiction uh, is that when people are in it, when people are experiencing, you know, giving this racism, uh, it's comforting. That power, that rush is comforting. And like I think, like I would suspect an addict would know that as they're becoming more addicted, that the drug is hurting them. Like they're cognizant of the fact that it's, you know, like this is killing me. I don't look the same. I don't feel the same as I used to, but man, I feel really good when I do it and I need more and more of it to feel better. That's kind of how hate is. When you're doing it, it's, it draws the attention of the people you're doing it with, the group of people. It, it, it fills you with this false sense of respect and power. Uh, but you also recognize that it's hurting you, it's hurting other people. And I think I got to the point in my racism where I just, I recognized that it was hurting the people around me that I cared about, uh, before I recognized it was hurting the people that I was actually, you know, hurting, that I was targeting. Uh, and that it really, and it started to happen when my children were born. That really was the most powerful thing for me. So I, you know, that's when I realized I want to look at this differently and see why do I feel that way about my family, but not about the actual people I'm hurting. And that's when I started to recognize I wasn't seeing them as people until I did. And, and that's when I started to feel very, very guilty about what I did, even still not having the courage to leave the group that I was a part of. I had doubts. Well, at first I had doubts every day of those eight years, but the last couple of years I was really seriously having doubts, but I was like a, a leader. I was, you know, singing in a band. I had all this kind of success within that movement, but it was a struggle. I had stopped the violence, but I was still putting on a show as far as like making music and, and whatnot. It was the hardest thing I ever had to do was not to leave the racism. I'd given that up while I was still in it. Uh, the hardest thing to do was starting over with that identity, community, and purpose. And that's what I've been working those 10,000 plus hours on, and I feel very comfortable with now. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, now, you made some comments that brought up COVID-19 for me in reference to, you know, uncertainties and yeah. society. So what's your sense of, number one in general, how the state of hate, in America today, in the world, in fact, because you're a global international uh, speaker and, and doing the work on all levels in reference to that. What's your sense of the state of hate? But particularly as we look at, as you mentioned, the uncertainty associated with COVID-19 quarantine, the time we're in. Yeah, I would say this is probably the scariest time for me uh, because you know, I think for everybody, COVID has been the biggest uncertainty of maybe our lifetimes, you know, of our generation. You know, the first time in, you know, in my experience, we've been kind of asked to stay home, stores have been closed, people are out of work, you know, at levels since the Great Depression. I mean, this is, this is kind of the biggest moment, uh, you know, of our lifetimes right now. So, it's uncertain. We don't know when it's going to end. We don't know, you know, how many more people are going to die. And yet there are people out there who are protesting, who are, you know, kind of uh, shirking the, the stay at home, uh, you know, orders and suggestions. Um, so I can see, I can already see how this is starting to build up to something that I think is going to get much, much worse and much more violent over time uh, as more people are out of work, as, you know, the unknowing of when things are going to open back up or when we might be able to travel or see our families like we used to before. Um, it, it has become a time when people, you know, are more susceptible. Uh, but again, it's become a time when, when the propagandists have, have been in overdrive, uh, putting out propaganda to not only recruit people, but to confuse them more, 
right? They've been flooding the pool with conspiracy theories, with this medicine doesn't work, or 5G causes coronavirus. I mean, like ridiculous stuff that's flooding out there. Why? To create the conditions of uncertainty. So when there's already uncertainty and they're feeding more on top of it, uh, I think we're, you know, I think we're in a really dangerous place right now. Um, and I'm not sure how to answer the question of how we get out of it, except uh, that we're just all going to have to be very, very careful with our eyes open. And I think this may get worse before it gets better in terms of extremism related to the coronavirus. Yeah. So uh, it makes me wonder, like, what should we be saying to kids, to young people today? I mean, I, I want to be narrow and say white kids white males even more narrowly, but I'm just thinking in general, as we look at uh, what this uncertainty, what this confusion is just doing to our young people in general. So um, I'll keep it broad. If you had, I see Obama's gonna do a, uh, a, a, a inauguration or a graduation speech for all the graduates, right? But if you could speak to all the kids about this uncertainty as it relates to your life experience, particularly as it relates to not only, you know, preventing or participating in this hate, but also fighting back, challenging yeah. this hate. What would be your two or three minute PSA to young people today? Well, I, I, honestly, I would speak to, the, to adults on behalf of young people and say, we need to listen rather than speak. We need to be listening more. Uh, because, you know, uh, Khalil Gibran, you know, famous uh, Lebanese poet said, you know, you don't really, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, you don't really learn much by listening uh, to people. You learn by listening to the words that they don't say. Uh, so I think we need to also be listening to that because here, here's the deal. If we don't create a safe space for our kids to be able to speak to us about what might be bothering them, and if we don't act vulnerably and share what's bothering us or what might be broken within us with our children, they will never learn to do that with us. They will never, because they see us like superheroes or authority figures uh, that will either punish them or not listen to them or see them as invisible or as a joke if they share something that they think is important with us. And the way we, we fix that is we have to learn to be able to share our own vulnerabilities and be cautiously vulnerable with young people, right? There were points when we were worried about our ears being too big, if we were too short, if our breath smelled, if you know we weren't good looking. We all have these insecurities and we still do, right? So we have to share that with our young people so that we can build a culture where they can share the things that they're uncertain about with us. And we have to create a safe place for them to do so and to grow from it together. Uh, to young people, I would say, uh, they're the ones that are gonna, save us from this unfortunately and i apologize you know from my generation to theirs for having put this on them but please learn from our mistakes and don't further them by creating more polarization uh, we have to find a way to prevent this from happening in the future if we ever want um, to to beat it but here's the thing is we have to make a promise to them that we have to change the systemic and institutional racism that we have going on. Otherwise, we're just going to cre keep creating racists and we're going to create a, an environment where they'll never be able to solve the problems that we've created for them. Yeah. Now, I often wonder, has there been a role for people of color in extremist white supremacist groups organizations have you seen that in your experience and what's your sense of that because i i mean i i think we often just think white people white supremacy white supremacist groups what's been your sense of the role or the participation or the collaboration with people of color yeah unfortunately that's a that's a perplexing question that a lot of people ask and again if we think about it not as an ideological thing but a place where people really are rewarded by a sense of identity, community, and purpose, uh, that answers a lot of that question. How can, you know, I used to know uh, when I was a skinhead, a black guy who had two large swastikas tattooed on his arms, right? And he hung around, he said racist things. He, you know, he, there were other people who were Latino. I today work with uh, people who are Jewish, who, you know, whose parents come to me and say, my son's denying the Holocaust. You know, how the hell does that happen? Uh, and, and what I tell them is, is the ideology is just the permission slip for them to be angry. 
it's the it's the reward that they're getting from a sense of finally understanding who they are, even if it's not who they are. Uh, the community, the reward that they're getting from this new family, this new environment, and and the purpose that they've been filled with because of you know this this toxic belief. So they're drawing from it the you know the things that fulfill them uh, in human ways, but they're putting this this ideology on top. It doesn't make any sense except that we're human beings and we want to be seen. We want to be respected. And sometimes the only people that will do that to us are, you know, toxic people. And, and we, you know, we want to fit in regardless because the reward we're getting from that is, is greater than what we weren't getting before. doesn't make sense, my friend. I don't know. Oh, I mean, man, it, it's, it's it heavy. listen, it doesn't make sense for anybody to join these groups because the whole purpose of these groups is to scorch the earth and not about the individual. It's not about the person. So everybody who joins these groups is, is really compromising themselves as a human being by doing so. Yeah. Well, I just, um, been grappling with this internal question about what is a racist? Who is a racist? What is an anti-racist? Reading, reading Brother uh, 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 Kendi X's uh, book uh, about anti-racism and being an anti-racist. And it's uh, just one of those things that this stop, this immediate halt to all the stuff I've been doing has had me reflecting upon. And uh, so, uh, uh, it's just helpful to just not even know the answer is clear, just to hear some articulation. But I'm wondering for you, uh, what have you been reflecting on in this time? Uh, first, how are you doing being quarantined there, uh, my friend? Uh, and and it, uh, is there some introspection going on? And give me a sense of, of, of just what you've been thinking about during this time. Yeah. Uh, well, I've, I think I've completed every home project known to man. I don't think I have anything <laughs> left to do. Uh, but, you know, I've been kind of self-quarantined since March and, uh, you know, doing our part. I, I really see this as a service. Like, we are all pitching in. We are all like, you know, this is, this is not about doing nothing. This is actively doing nothing to do something. Uh, and that's to stop the spread of this virus. Uh, what have I been reflecting on, I think, is the fact that it's just not good enough to not be racist, we have to actively be anti-racist. This is a time when we cannot turn a blind eye to what's happening. There are too many people being impacted by this on a daily basis. The signs are too obvious. Uh, and we ha if, we don't, if we don't wanna be known as the good Germans who went along with what they saw happening in 1933 and 1934, and then all of a sudden were very surprised by what happened, we need to really be, um, we need to be more proactive now in making sure that we're shaping the future that we want and actively encouraging the people that were harmed by the past to help build that future together. That's important to me. So I've been thinking a lot about that. Yeah. So what can we expect from you over the next 10 years? What, what, what are some projects you're working on? Or you got some, some, some ideas, some goals you're working on that you can share with us? I mean, what are you going to be when you grow up? What's, what's on the horizon the next decade? You know, man, I learned to I learned to not ask kids what they want to be when they grow up, and instead asking them what problems they want to solve. Yeah. Uh, the, so I think I'll continue doing what I'm doing. Uh, you know, I don't unfortunately think that you know this is a problem that we're going to solve uh, quickly. Uh, it's something that's I think going to take some some really serious work, uh, and I'll be I'll be doing that. Um, Man, 10 years, of, I'm trying to get through today, my friend. Yeah. Uh, 10 years from now, I hope to still be alive, be healthy, and, and hopefully be in a better place, uh, you know, for more people than we are today. Yeah. Well, um, we're going to let you go. We appreciate the time. Um, I, I, I've been asking people one last question because uh, we find that folks have a little extra time during quarantine. So we're wondering, uh, we're trying to build a what to read, what to watch, what to miss. <laughs> Is there anything you've been reading, watching, listening to that you want to add to our list? It could be something you learn or learn from or something that just takes you away. Um, uh, well, what I'm going to recommend, recommend two books. Okay. And, okay. There, and since you were talking about Ibram X. Kendi, I'm going to recommend Stamped from the Beginning. That's an amazing book. And then also a person I respect a lot, Eve Ewing from Chicago, Ghosts uh, in the Schoolyard. 
Yeah, yeah. So a little bit, a little bit of racism in Chicago history there. Um, you know, we were in the Red Summer last year, and you know, the anniversary of of, of the Red Summer, and, and you know, we don't talk about a lot of this history that you know, racist history that we've experienced, like the you know, the massacre in Tulsa and things like that. So you know, hopefully, uh, the future holds that we will want to learn more, and we will want to learn the truth. Yeah. Well, I think every Chicagoan has to answer this question. My <laughs> last burning question. I don't know. I think I know what it's going to be, but go ahead. I know what it is, so I'm sure you've had some fact. Is it LeBron James or is it Michael Jordan? MJ, man. Come on. MJ. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not about giving up where I live or anything like that, but let's just say I can see the United Center from where I live and and – and I can still hear the roars of the nineties coming from there, man. It was probably, here's a secret. I was a racist at the time. This was like, you know, 92, 93, 94. I was a skinhead. And I got to say, I was so proud of, of our Chicago Bulls during that time. And I was a big Jordan fan then and, and, and even more so. now. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, bro, we appreciate you giving us some time and, um, uh, uh, not sure what's going to happen over this next decade. I will say if there's any way that WPC, the Privilege Institute, can be in collaboration with you, let me know. And the next time I'm in the shy, I'll holler at you. And if you ever get to God's country here in Green Bay, Wisconsin, let us know. You know it, man. Peace. Peace, my brother. Cheers. Appreciate Thank you. you. See you, Eddie. All right.